Today is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. It is also the feast day of a confessor of the faith, St. Remigius. And so the second oration of the Mass is taken from the Mass of that feast day of St. Remigius. There's a third oration also in which we invoke the intercession of our Blessed Lady and all the saints in heaven to pray for us here on earth. Now I do ask you to please keep in your prayers those who are suffering, remember those who are suffering with illness or any other great hardship, uh, and also remember the souls of the deceased, uh, especially our recently deceased uh, fond memory. Please remember Mr. Rentschler, remember Mr. Evans, Mrs. Lamb. Please uh, keep in your prayers all of those dear souls we know, and uh, also uh, Robert Burns as well. Now, I do ask you to pray in particular for Mr. Riley and his family. Paul is still suffering, suffering greatly, so please uh, do remember him in your prayers. And also a gentleman uh, of our parish who recently had a heart attack. We have been praying for him, and uh, he does ask that we continue those prayers on his behalf. And he thanks you very much for your charity in beseeching God on his behalf. Now. You see, we have uh, some beautiful feast days coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow we have the Feast of the Guardian Angels. We thank God for giving us these angel, angel guardians to, uh, to protect us on our way through this life. And we also have on Tuesday the Feast of St. Teresa, the Child of Jesus, a very great saint of our own times who uh, set the example of complete surrender to the will of God in all things and uh, a very powerful saint indeed, even in her own little way, as she called it. And on Wednesday, the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, who bore the stigmata, the wounds of Christ in his own body. Now, this Friday, we have the first Friday of the month of October, and uh, the first Saturday. And so we will be uh, having the Blessed Sacrament on the altar during that night for adoration to thank our Lord for being here with us as our Emmanuel, God, God with us. And uh, I do thank you for your fidelity to your pledges through all these years. I know that the source of many graces for your families and for our church as a, as a whole. So I thank you very much for maintaining those hours of prayer over the Friday through Saturday, Friday night through Saturday morning. Remember that we have a public rosary, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. The, ordinarily, the public rosary downtown is uh, on the first Sunday of the month, but on this first Sunday, there are a number of other things happening, some pro-life events happening on this side of the, uh, of the river and, and on the Kentucky side as well, and we have the, the annual golf outing too. So the, the public rosary will take place next Sunday. That's the Feast of St. Bridget, and just after the day after the Feast of the, of the Rosary of Our Lady, which has won such great battles against the enemies of God here, even in this world. And so I ask you to uh, beware of that, and at 2 o'clock, join us, uh, not tomorrow, not uh, this afternoon, but next Sunday afternoon for that Rosary. Now remember, the enemies of Christ have stated their their intention is to actually drive from the face of the earth all memory of our Lord, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection. They want to drive from the face of the earth all memory of the sacrifice of redemption that he made for us. Voltaire said so explicitly. That was his goal. The Masons of Italy explicitly stated their intention was to do, as Voltaire had prescribed, to make all mankind forget the life and death and resurrection of our Lord. And you realize that when you are praying the rosary and meditating upon the mysteries of the gospel, you are actually not allowing that to happen. You are actually directly answering that, that um, intention of our Lord's enemies to make him completely forgotten. When you pray the rosary, you are pondering in your heart, even as it, the gospel says our blessed mother did, you're pondering over the events of our Lord's life in your heart. And that is a great thing in the eyes of God. So please pray. 
Now, all young adults are invited to a fall get-together, a party at uh, the home of the Schopachers in Greenfield on Saturday, October 14th at 4 p.m. I have a partial announcement in the bulletin. I'm sorry. Um, there, there's a line that did not appear. It does not appear. It will appear next Sunday with information you need. But please contact Victoria Schopacher. Uh, concerning that party, I'm very grateful that we have these events offered for our young people. They, they are very important. Now, we have the golf outing today. And again, I'm very grateful to those who worked so hard for the success of this endeavor. It is uh, important to us on many levels, not just the financial level, although that, that is important. Um, so I, I thank you for working so hard to make this successful. There is also the online auction. Uh, you have a flyer in your bulletin concerning that, and you see that there are items that have been donated out of the charity, of the, the goodness of heart of people to support our church and school. And I thank them for that generosity, items that could be of great use to some of you, perhaps all of you. So please take a look at that. And even if you're not a golfer, you can still support the, uh, the golf outing endeavor by this means, taking advantage of the opportunity that the, the generosity of these good people have, have provided for us. Now, also, I need to announce a, well, what we consider truly a blessed event, the ordination of two new priests, young priests, Father Harbor and Father Peters. You noticed I've had an announcement in the bulletin carried from Sunday to Sunday for some time now. Well, uh, now that they are ordained, they are coming here to us. Uh, Father Paul Krug, a good uh, friend of many of you, I know, from his past visits, uh, is going to be coming uh, on the evening of the Feast of the Kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, Sunday, October 29th. Father Krug will be arriving here with uh, the two newly ordained priests, Father Harbour and Father Peters. And they'll be with us for then, for several days, well, for a few days, um, Father Harbor will offer one of his first solemn masses here at the altar of our church. And uh, <clears throat> Father Krug, Father ba uh, Greenwell, and uh, Father Peters and I will assist him <clears throat> in that solemn mass. And that will be the early evening of October 30th, Monday. And after that, there will be a celebratory dinner reception for the two newly ordained priests. And I encourage you all to attend both the masses and the, and the celebration to thank God for giving this grace. And then Father Peters will offer his first solemn mass here the following day, October 31st, which will be a day of recollection. <clears throat> and during that day of recollection at about 10, uh, 10.30 or so that morning, he will also offer a solemn mass here at the church. And um, that will be for our students who are on the day of recollection, but also for any homeschoolers who would like to come. You are more than cordially invited to attend. Please contact the, please contact the school office to take part in that day of recollection. There will be uh, actually five priests here to conduct the Day of Recollection, so it should be adequate personnel on hand to take care of all of the students, actually, so, and all of the homeschoolers, too. So I invite you to come and take part in that wonderful occasion. Now, um, I should mention also that um, there will be a date set very soon for confirmations this spring. So if you are uh, preparing or prepared for confirmation this year, please be sure to let us know uh, well enough in advance uh, so that we can keep you informed about uh, all the arrangements. And we thank God for that. <coughs> now the epistle for this, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Brethren, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given you in Christ Jesus, that in all things you are made rich in him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, 
so that nothing is wanting to you in any grace, waiting for the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also will confirm you unto the end without crime in the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, Jesus entered into a boat, passed over the water, and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him one sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the sick man sick of this palsy, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, He blasphemeth. And Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose and went into his house. And the multitude, seeing it, feared and glorified God, who had given such power to men. <coughs> <coughs> As far as the words of today's Holy Gospel, please be seated. <coughs> be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In this reading from the very beginning of St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, he tells those whom he's just greeted in the Lord that he gives thanks to God for them. <clears throat> that he thanks God for them and he thanks God for the graces that the Lord has given them. And that is true to this day <clears throat> of your priests here, Father Greenwell and I, give thanks for you. We thank God for you. And we thank God for all the graces that he's given you. We thank him for the graces he has given you already, which he's given you now, but also for the graces of the future. We already thank him. Thank him for the graces that he has yet to give you because they are many and they are very powerful. We pray also <clears throat> that they will overcome all obstacles and accomplish the great work for which God gives them. Now we read in the gospel today, one of the means that our Lord has given a, a channel of grace that our Lord has presented to us. It is related in today's gospel in a special way, attached to a miracle. You see, it says in the gospel today that our Lord made his way across the water, that's the Sea of Galilee, to his own city, and his own city was Capernaum. When our Lord had left that very happy and blessed home of Nazareth, <clears throat> the home where he, which he shared with Mary, the Blessed Mother, <clears throat> and his foster father, St. Joseph, until Joseph passed away. <clears throat> and our Lord left Nazareth and went to Capernaum. He there was on the very edge of the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Genezareth, as it was sometimes called. And it was from there that our Lord called his apostles. It was there that he found Peter and James and John and Andrew tending their nets <clears throat> after a fruitless night of fishing or attempting to fish. It was there that our Lord called Peter to be the fisher of men. And it was from there that our Lord would set out on his missionary journeys throughout the entire region. Capernaum, a large city for that area and very much interested in what our Lord had to teach. Our Lord returned to Capernaum and while he was there in a private home teaching, he found himself engulfed in people, no doubt men, 
<clears throat> filled the house and surrounded him. And as he was teaching, something curious happened. Now, St. Matthew doesn't tell us this, but St. Mark does, <clears throat> that the crowd was so dense, so thick, that they could not make their way to our Lord with a man on a stretcher. There was a man who was sick of the palsy. And so they had to actually strip tiles off the very roof of the house and lower the stretcher down from above so the man sick of the palsy could have access to our Lord. Now we're not strangers to this sickness. We see in the gospel our Lord healing men with the palsy. There was a time when our Lord was a guest in the home of a Pharisee. <clears throat> and a, a man sick of the palsy was placed right in front of him, as it were almost daring our Lord to do something to heal that man on the Sabbath day. But our Lord did heal him. <clears throat> but this was different <clears throat> because our Lord finished speaking for a moment and turned to the gentleman lying there so sick on that stretcher and he said to him be of good heart son thy sins are forgiven thee this was of course a far cry from what they had hoped for what did this mean to them thy sins are forgiven thee be of good heart thy sins are forgiven thee well that was a, a very shocking thing for our Lord to say at that time <clears throat> The scribes who were there protested quietly among themselves, muttering, who is this? As if to say, who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And you know what? They were right. Only God can forgive sins. <clears throat> and why is that so? Because, because sin is an attack on God, his sovereignty. His goodness, this particular kind of sin, which they called blasphemy, was arrogating to oneself the power of God, pretending in a sense to be God. That's how they saw it. <clears throat> Little did they realize who it was who had said those words, thy sins are forgiven thee. But the scribes were there. They didn't mention the Pharisees. It's interesting. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Pharisees are not mentioned as though they're not crowded into this space. <clears throat> Maybe because of the pride of the Pharisees, they thought it was degrading for them to being elbow to elbow with the commoners. After all, they were the pure ones, the separated ones, as their name Pharisee implies. <clears throat> the scribes were there, though, and they were there not out of devotion, but they were there to spy. They were there to criticize. They were there to oppose our Lord, if they could. And this statement of our Lord, be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee, is a perfect opportunity for them to mutter under their breath, <clears throat> but loudly enough, perhaps, for others to hear their protest. He's blaspheming. He's blaspheming against God. He, man as he is, is claiming to have the powers of God. <clears throat> Sin is committed against God. Only God has the power to forgive it. Our Lord knew their thoughts. The Gospel says he saw their thoughts. God has the power to peer into the very core of our being, into the very center of our souls, and know exactly who we are and exactly what we're thinking. <clears throat> and our Lord stopped, and he, he addressed them. He said, why, why are you thinking these thoughts against me? Why do you criticize or condemn me for this? And he said, which is easier to, to say, thy sins are forgiven thee, or arise and walk? Now this tells us that our Lord was actually performing this miracle for the sake of faith. He wasn't only concerned about healing the body, he was primarily concerned with healing the soul. During his life on earth, our Lord did many powerful things. Uh, walking on water, raising the dead to life, giving hearing to the deaf and sight to the blind, feeding thousands in the desert with a handful of bread. And yet, our Lord didn't come for any of that. That was not his purpose. He did all of those things for one thing. That is, he came to move the soul, to move the souls of men, to faith, to hope, to charity, to love of God. 
he came to move us to repentance. He would come to die on the cross for us, to redeem us, but that would not be enough to save us. He needed us also to cooperate with his grace and to repent of our sins. And our Lord wanted to show all of those present and us today by the reason of this miracle that he did indeed have the power here on earth to forgive sins. <clears throat> so having asked this question of the scribes, which is easier to do, without another word, our Lord turns to the, the poor sick man lying there so helpless in this crowd. <clears throat> and our Lord said, Arise, stand up, take up your bed, and walk to your house. Carry your own bed that you were carried in with. Carry it out and carry it to your house. <clears throat> That's how we know, by the way, that this man was not a stranger to those who had brought him in. <clears throat> he lived there in Capernaum. They knew who he was. They knew his condition. <clears throat> they knew this was a real miracle when they saw him stand up on his feet that had been swollen <clears throat> with edema, wet legs that had been weakened perhaps by weeks of incapacity and being carried about on a stretcher. Uh, he suddenly had the strength to stand up and not only to stand but to bend over, pick up his stretcher and carry it away, to carry it away into his own house. Now this, of course, caused quite a stir among those who were present. The gospel says the multitude seeing it feared. <clears throat> what they fear, they recognize a power here that they could not understand, a power that was so great <clears throat> that it could overcome. <clears throat> and when they realized it was not only a power that could give strength to weakened legs and give the power to walk to a man who had become so debilitated, they realized it was also a power that could forgive sins. And they knew that only God could forgive sins. Now we had reason to fear with a reverential fear, not with a servile fear of a slave, but the fear of reverence for seeing something so great it surpassed their ability to comprehend it. <clears throat> and they glorified God with that reverential fear of God. They glorified him. They praised him that he had given such power to men. <clears throat> now they still knew very well that our Lord was man and that <clears throat> he himself referred to himself as the Son of Man. And so he was. <clears throat> but he was God become the Son of Man, as he showed so clearly by his death and resurrection. <clears throat> the very night of the resurrection, our Lord answered this miracle. You might say, in a way, the night of the resurrection, our Lord completed this miracle. <clears throat> when our Lord appeared to the apostles, <clears throat> in their fear, as they were all hunkered down in the upper room with the doors bolted, <clears throat> the first thing our Lord said to them was, peace be to you, a greeting of friendship. They were afraid of the Jews outside the door, and then they were terrified of our Lord who appeared to them inside the door. And our Lord's first word to them, peace be to you, the, the words of friendship. And then the gospel tells us that our Lord showed them his hands and his feet. You know very well the account of that. Thomas wasn't there. Later on, he would say, unless I see the marks of the wounds in his hands and his feet, or his hands in his side, I will not believe. The first thing our Lord did was show the apostles these marks. They were the credentials of his life, of his death, and now his resurrection. Unmistakable. And so they, they believed, they believed that it was truly the Son of God risen from the dead. And then our Lord repeated his greeting, <clears throat> saying, peace be to you. He said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. <clears throat> now this is literally fulfilling what the people before had glorified God, for giving this power to men. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. But our Lord didn't stop there. He continued, he said, Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. 
even here implying that if the apostles had a judgment to make between forgiving in God's name or not, <clears throat> that they had to know what sins they were forgiving. In other words, the foundation was laid for the idea of the need to confess our sins, to make them known, to be forgiven. <clears throat> this was startling, shocking, <clears throat> perhaps even more startling to the apostles who heard these words from our Lord than the words that our Lord addressed to this poor paralytic <clears throat> a year before. <clears throat> the apostles had been ordained priests at the Last Supper when our Lord gave them the command to do what he had done there at the Last Supper, consecrate the body and blood that would be offered on the cross. <clears throat> but our Lord, <clears throat> in ordaining them, in giving them the power of the priesthood, did not give them the power they could use yet. It was only that very night of his resurrection, after he had died on the cross, that Jesus said to them, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Why would they have been so startled by this? Because they were sinful men themselves, and how well they knew that. Our Lord was talking to Peter. <clears throat> Our Lord was talking to James and, and Philip and Bartholomew, the men who had abandoned him, the men who had denied him. Peter, who had cursed and sworn that he never even knew him. These were the sinners our Lord was telling, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. <clears throat> Only John the Apostle had stood firm by the side of Our Lady under the cross, but the rest well knew what it meant to need forgiveness. How well they knew the importance of forgiveness. <clears throat> and maybe that's why our Lord chose them so that they would understand the significance of what he was telling them, so that they would understand the significance of what he was giving them, the power that he was entrusting to them. And so he invested that forgiving power in his church to his apostles, and he sent them out 40 days later to justify from sin, to sanctify by the power of God's grace, and ultimately to give hope of being glorified in everlasting life. This is what our Lord came to do, precisely this. St. Paul said he thanked God for the graces that he gave. Well, among those graces was certainly this, this power that our Lord won at such a great price and then invested in his own church, in his apostles, and told them to take it into the world and use it and use it for our benefit. The prophet Isaiah said 700 years before our Lord was born that when he, the Savior, came, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, and the lame would walk. 700 years after that, St. John the Baptist would send his disciples to Jesus, asking, Art thou the one who is to come? And Jesus would say to those messengers, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. Tell him, The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. This was the mark of the Messiah that he had come. We thank our Lord for giving us the grace now to live at this time, that we can look back to this moment. We have the Gospels instructing us and portraying for us this great event. When our Lord said to this paralytic, "Take, be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. We realize that our Lord continues to say that in the world today through the power of the sacrament that he has established here for us to grant us the forgiveness we need to be saved. We thank Almighty God for sending his Son. We thank that Son for coming and his own sending of the Holy Ghost to us to guide us even in these times. We thank our Lord for bringing to earth this power and applying it to our souls that we too may arise and walk. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.